Romans chapter 1. What we're going to do this morning is that we're going to dive in and uh, we're going to look at, we're going to set the context as we move along uh, to discover, you know, uh, who's writing this book, who he's writing to, why he's writing to them, and what this book uh, is about. So Romans chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to read the verse, first seven verses there. We may actually not get out of the first verse this morning, but we're, we're going to set our ambitions a little high here, and we're going to look at, go ahead and read the first seven verses. It says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are called the called of Jesus Christ. And pay attention to that part right there. You also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we need you. We need your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us, Lord. Uh, we want to know these things in, a, in an intimate way. And it takes the leadership of your Holy Spirit to bring us to that place. Uh, Lord, where there's much to learn through this book, and we approach it with great anticipation in our hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Paul. So that's where we want to begin. Paul. Who's Paul? Um, Paul is actually the, the writer or the author of two-thirds of the New Testament. Much what we know concerning church doctrine, how to walk in the Spirit, you know, con the things concerning the Spirit. It's the Apostle Paul who, who's brought that to us. And again, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Now, the Apostle Paul has not always been a friend of the church. In fact, he begins as, with the name Saul early on. He's known as Saul. And he was actually a persecutor of the church. He was actually, he set out to destroy the church, to annihilate the church. We're told that he was a man with great zeal. He certainly had a zeal for God, but it was a misplaced zeal. And so he was one who, who, who with this great zeal for God, was seeking to do God a favor by wiping out, by eliminating all Christians. That is until he's confronted by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Paul had letters to, to imprison Christians. He was actually a, playing a part in, in, in killing Christians, persecuting Christians, throwing Christians into prison, you know, ripping mothers and ch children apart from one another. He, he was vicious in his desire to eliminate the church. That is until he's on the road to Damascus and he's confronted by Jesus Christ himself. And Jesus says to him, with this bolt of lightning come from the sky. It knocks Paul to the ground. He's blinded. And Paul hears this voice coming, you know, from, in it, you know, from his position of blindness. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And uh, G Saul responds, the apostle Paul, he responds, who are you, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus, the one that you're persecuting. So it's at this point, Paul is transformed. His, he, he, he becomes a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He becomes uh, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And at this, this point, there's a little shortly afterward, he changes his name from Saul to Paul. Saul means great one or powerful one. It, that's that's what, how it can be translated. Paul actually means small one, little one. That's, that was Paul's attitude toward himself. Now, from, the, from a man's perspective, Paul was certainly a great one. Thus his name, Saul, great one. Uh, Paul was a Pharisee, as we shall learn as we go through this. He was once a Pharisee, which means as a Pharisee, he was very rich. He was very powerful. He, was, he had a very rich upbringing. 
Um, he had personal tutors all of his life that would, you know, as he was learning the Old Testament, learning the law of the Old Testament, he had personal tutors. He had one of the greatest teachers of Israel, a man by the name of Gamaliel. And um, it was much like, you know, Josephus, or not Josephus, but Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, Nicodemus, that's what I'm trying to think. <laughs> Nicodemus, you know, Jesus referred to G Nicodemus as the, the teacher of Israel. Well, Gamaliel was numbered right up among them. Paul was also, from what we understand, he was also a member of the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish Supreme Court. There was a 70-member panel. It could be, you know, equivalent to our Supreme Court in the United States. Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin. So he was very rich. He was very powerful uh, because, you know, we know that he was very rich. His family was very rich by his uh, education. And Paul refers to this in, as we get into Philippians chapter 4. I'll read that to you this morning. He, he, we read, he says, Philippians, I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 4. He says, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. He's referring to, you know, he's saying that if anyone has confidence in flesh, he goes on to say, I far more. What he's doing is talking about grace and the law and this upbringing he had in the law. He's declaring his, uh, his knowledge of the law. He says, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more, circumcised on the eighth day. That means that he was born obeying the law. His, his mother and father was obeying the law of God, the law of the Old Testament. He says, of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin was the most loyal tribe in all of Israel. And that's what Paul's saying. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. He says, as, to, as a persecutor of the church, I'm sorry, the, of a Hebrew among Hebrews. You, you line up a bunch of Hebrews, he says, I'm the top dog. I'm the Hebrew among all Hebrews. He says, as to the law, a Pharisee. He was a, in other words, you know, a Pharisee is one who made sure everyone else was keeping the law. He's kind of like a religious police. When I was in uh, Saudi Arabia, there was a, there were, they ha also had religious police. They were called the Fatah. And uh, if you broke their religious laws in Saudi Arabia, it doesn't matter if you're American or not, they would come up and they had this little stick and they would whip the back of your legs. I experienced that I, because I dared to touch a woman in public. <laughs> so that's something you don't do. And as soon as I did, we were just in this gold market. And I, was, I was with my friend here and I just happened to touch her arm and I was going to point out this gold necklace. And the moment I did that, they were watching. They had a stick. They started whipping me on the back of the legs. They, they made sure people kept the law. Paul says, I was a Pharisee. I made sure people kept the law. And what Paul's argument here is, you know, it's no longer about the law. But he was ta talking about his position, his upbringing. He says, uh, as, a, as to zeal a persecutor of the church... As to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. If you were to look at the Apostle Paul and evaluate his life, he says, I would be found blameless. There, you could not find anything that I was doing wrong. You know, I, I made sure every single sin was accounted for. Of course, he, later on he will confess that he was still a sinful man. Because the sin was within him. But as far as appearance, as far as all the religious people, the religious establishment, the Apostle Paul was one who could not be found, you know, with blame. He was blameless, he said. But whoever, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I counted as loss. I love how the, uh, the King James Version translates this because it translates it more accurately and it uses the word dung <laughs> i count it as dung as poop <laughs> it's, it's nothing in, in other words everything he grew up being and becoming paul says all that background without christ jesus is dung it's dung and he, he would also boast in galatians chapter 1 verse 10 um he says, 
He says, For I am now, for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? He says, If I were still striving to please men, I would not be a bond servant of Jesus Christ. In other words, if I was still seeking to please men, to be impressing men, he's saying I would still be a Pharisee. I would still be a leader in the nation of Israel. But I've stepped down from that position to serve my Lord Jesus Christ. And that's one of the things that Paul was unique, was in such a unique position to do. He knew that Old Testament law better than anyone else. He knew that law. He understood the law. He just did not have, he was looking through the law with the wrong lens, from the wrong perspective. He said that, you know, from that perspective, everything is dumb. It's worthless. But now that I have the Lord Jesus Christ, and now I can truly see, now I can truly understand what that law was about. And that's one of the things that the book of Romans is going to be showing us. Because it's, the book of Romans is going to be talking about the, um, the... By the way, when Paul proclaimed the gospel message, as he does to the Romans here, he did not have the New Testament. Peter, Paul, James, and John, no one had the New Testament. No one had the writings of Paul. Everything was going, coming from the Old Testament. And it was the giving of the Holy Spirit that enabled them to see the mysteries that were written in the Old Testament. And that's one of the things that Paul's going to declare. Everything that, you know, that he's going to describe, he's, he's telling us, is coming from the Old Testament. It was all declared in, t in the Old Testament. God told us from the very beginning what he was going to do. We just could not fully see it. We just could not fully understand it. So what the New Testament is doing is revealing, unveiling what God was talking about in the Old Testament. So he's going to be referring to all these Old Testament doctrines showing us how God was telling us exactly what he was going to do. The New Testament, as we see it today, is simply telling us how God did it. The Old Testament is saying, this is how I'm going to do it. The New Testament says, this is how I did it. So that's the th deal, is that Paul's going to be presenting all these Old Testament doctrines. If you want to know how to walk, how to talk, how to live, the book of Romans is for you. If you want a new perspective on life, if you want a peace that surpasses all understanding, the book of Romans is for you. But you must be willing to apply What's being taught here? And I'm telling you, it's one of the most freeing books I've ever been into. The most freeing book I've ever studied out, and when I come to realize what it was saying, was the book of Galatians. That changed my life radically. The book of Romans is equal to that. The book of Romans can radically change your life, but you've got to stand ready to receive what it's saying to you. So, We've gotten past the first word now. <laughs> and Paul says, he, he's introduced himself, the Apostle Paul. Does everyone understand who the Apostle Paul is now? Right? All right. See, he's the writer of many of the books that we find in the New Testament. You know, the book of uh, Galatians, the book of Philippians, the book of Ephesians, the book of Colossians. Uh, many of these old New Testament books is written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, Paul... Again, he was in a unique position because he had this upbringing in the Old Testament law. He was in this uh, unique position to, to take, you know, by the way of the Holy Spirit and explain everything to us now. So Paul, he says, a bond servant of Christ Jesus. The Greek word that's used there for bond servant is dulios. Dulios. Uh... It's actually, um, it's the Greek name, but it's a reference to an Old Testament law that's found in Exodus chapter 21. It actually literally means, bond servant literally means a slave by choice. Paul says, I'm one who's choosing 
to be a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, a slave by choice. You see, in the Old Testament, we may argue against slavery today, but it was actually something that was accepted in the Old Testament. Not that God saying, was saying that slavery is good, but a man could, in the Old Testament, sell himself, his life, to someone else in order to pay off a debt. Or if he owes a man a certain amount of debt, he could serve that man and, and, and until his debt was paid off. But he could not serve any, th any more than six years. After six years of service, no matter how much was remaining of that debt, this man had to be set free. But God also made a provision in the law that he did not have to be set free if he chose to remain with his, his master. And this often happened. Because what, what a man would discover is he began to serve as a slave and says, you know what, I've got it pretty good here in my master's house. I don't have to worry about the mortgage. I don't have to worry about the electric bill. I don't have to worry about putting food on my table, clothes on my back, food. You know, I don't have to worry about anything. I've got it good in my master's house. My master loves me. My master takes care of me. You know, I don't have to worry about a thing. That's what Paul's saying. My master is the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm serving him. I don't have to worry about thi a thing because I'm, I'm his servant. I'm simply following after him. Is my mic cutting out out there? Just did one. So, okay. So, um, so Paul's saying, I'm a bond servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he goes on to tell us that he has a specific task. He's choosing to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, but the Lord Jesus Christ has commissioned him for a specific task. He says, called, it says, as an apostle, that word as, you'll notice in your Bibles, if you're in the NASB, that it's in italics. Anytime you see a word in the Bible in italics, it means it's not there. It's just added there to give clar uh, clarification. Paul's not saying I'm called as an apostle. Paul's saying I am an apostle. <laughs> I, I, God has called me to apostleship. Uh, that's, that's a part of my identity now. I've been sent out. That's what uh, apostle means, one who is sent out. One who is sent out, and he's going to tell us that he has a specific task because he's chosen to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. He's being ser uh, obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's sent out with a specific task. Now, you've got to understand, Paul was one who was sent out to the Gentiles. You may remember Peter. Everyone know who Peter is in the, in the New Testament? Yeah, so Peter, was, uh, was, his apostleship was to the Jew. And James, the brother of Jesus, half-brother of Jesus, his apostleship was to the Jew. But Paul's apostleship was to the Gentile. The, Peter and James and many others, they had a specific task to, to, re, to minister to the religious people. We're going to get deeper into this as we get into verse 16. You may want to jump ahead and look at verse 16. There was this religious group, the religious people, the Jew. That's who Peter was called to minister to. Paul was to go out into the Gentile world. Now, you've got to understand the Gentile world at this point. We think it's bad right now because you've got, a, you know, you've got abortion, you've got homosexuality, you have gen transgender lifestyle, you have drugs, you've got you know, the, just this selfish, selfish society. The, you know, there's the a society which now is blatantly worshiping Demons, we could see them during a football game, you know, during a halftime show. We could see it in the Olympics. People are just blatantly, openly worshiping demons. But precious people, we ain't seen anything yet. It's going to get worse. And it was much worse in Paul's day than in our day. You see, Paul was one who was sent out into a dark, diabolical, depressing, despairing world. You know, because sometimes we think as Christians that we're supposed to hide out, you know, be confine ourselves, not to be in this world, right? We want to close our eyes, we want to close our ears and just kind of isolate ourselves. And many Christians actually do that. You know, we got, you know, the Mormons, not the Mormons, but the, um, uh, the Amish. They, you know, they kind of isolate themselves from this world. That's not our calling. That was not Paul's calling. He was to go in, into a dark world. He was actually writing this from Corinth. 
He, he, he wanted to go to Rome, and again, we'll get deeper into that in just a moment, but he wanted to go to Rome, but he couldn't get there. But he gets held up in Corinth for a, a couple of months, and that's when he sat down and wrote this letter. But he's looking at the, the church in Corinth and how bad that, that world was. I mean, it was homosexuality, there was thievery, there was rape, there was murder, there was incest. It was just a real... He kind of touched upon this when he talked about the Cretans last week. And I mean, th this, these were bad people. But there was a church there in Corinth. And this church would grow. It would, it would spread. You see, that's Paul's calling. calling. That's actually our calling. To go out into a dark world. To be an influence in a dark world. You see, the darker it is, the greater the light becomes. Right? You know, if I was to strike a match and hold it up in here, you could probably see the flame. But if, I, if we shut the lights off, then you could really see that flame. That flame would stand out. And that's our calling. That was Paul's calling. And we're not to shy away. He, Paul would later say, be in the world, but not of the world. He says, I'm serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's sending me into some very dark places. And I want to share with you, you, you this church that's in Rome, you know, this, this gospel message, this good news, so that you too, you know, because Rome was filled with just as much, you know, vileness as the rest of the world. In fact, there was probably more. They, had, they were worshiping all kinds of false gods, gods of sensuality, gods of power, gods of, you know, immorality. They, they, they served all kinds of gods. And so Paul's wanting to make sure they've got this gospel message so that they, they can spread even further. He says, set it apart for the gospel of God. The gospel. You know, we oftentimes hear in the gospel, the, you know, talking about that's a watered-down gospel. Well, the gospel simply means good news. <laughs> you, you know, there's, there's nothing to water down there. It's good news. Good news. That's what gospel means. And it, is, it always disturbs me when it says you soften the gospel, you water down the gospel. You cannot water down the gospel. It's good news. It's great news. Now, you can distort what's behind the gospel, but you can't, that's good news. God has come into the world so that we can have eternal life. He saved our wretched souls. That's good news. We're going to have it not, not based upon anything we've done, but solely based upon what He's done. But the question becomes, do we believe that? Do we believe that we're exiting this world soon and about to enter an eternal paradise? It's good news. Jesus has dealt with my sin. I don't, it's another thing about the, what we're looking at here. It's this, this book, the, the gospel, it's not about living a moral and ethical life. Do you realize that? It's not about living a moral and ethical life. It's not about being, you know, very strict and rigid in our lifestyle. It's the good news. We, you know, we can't earn our way into heaven. It's not about how much good you do or do not do. It's about what Jesus Christ has done. He declared from the cross of Calvary, it is finished. The work is done. Now the question again, do you believe that? Do you believe that we're exiting this wretched fallen world and going to heaven? If you believe that, your life will dramatically change. You'll begin to let go of the things that's held you in bondage. You'll begin to let go of these things in this world that has depressed you. These things that has drawn you into a place of, of fear, worry, and anxiety. It's good news. We're leaving someday soon. It's not, again, it's not about the living a moral to ethical life. It's not about living this religious life. But it will certainly change our hearts and who we are. We've got to take our focus off of the flesh. Paul says a mind that is set up on the flesh, looking a certain way, acting a certain way, talking a certain way, is flesh. But a mind that is set up on the Spirit is life and peace. See, we're, we're so accustomed because of the way we've been brought up, much like Paul was brought up. You've got to look a certain way. You've got to act a certain way. You've got to talk a certain way. Jesus Christ came to set us free from that. He came to set us free so that we may have a life of peace and of joy. But it comes by way of obedience. Of obedience to how His Spirit is speaking to you at any given moment. Paul left a life of, of, of uh, 
the lap of luxury. He, he, le he left a life of power, position, and prominence. And, but yet he's talking to us about the joy that we can have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was sitting in a prison right before he was beheaded. Caesar Nero was about to chop off his head. He was in this dark, depressing dungeon. It was cold. It was damp. Could you imagine what that prison might have been like? It was in a cave. Just imagine what that would have been like. Just imagine the odors. Just imagine, you know, I was just, uh, we were just on a camping trip, right? And I removed that valve, that, you know, for, for our clean out. And whew, the odors. Just, and then we're in open air. Could you imagine being in a cave where people are doing their business? And Paul's chained to a wall, right? He had been beaten. He's chained to a wall. He knows he's about to be beheaded. But in the book of uh, 2 Timothy, he's talking about the joy that he has in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's, you know, he's facing death, but he's talking about the life and the joy that he has in the Lord Jesus Christ. My point is, we live in a dark world. Things are about to get even worse, but we can have joy. We can have peace because of the gospel message, because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. He says, um, the gospel of God, which was promised beforehand. Again, we were talking about it in the prayer meeting this morning. This, that's the thread that runs from Genesis through Revelation. It's the promise of God. It's the promise of God's Redeemer. It was spoken of all throughout the Old Testament, but we see it manifested in the New Testament. But there's a great mystery that was hidden from mankind. It was spoken plainly of, but it was revealed by the Holy Spirit in the New Testament in the form of Jesus Christ through His prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The Gospel, again, it goes back to the Old Testament. It was spoken of, but it's revealed in the New Testament. Concerning His Son, that was the story that began in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Everything in the Old Testament was about His Son. Everything that was going on in the temple or in the tabernacle, in the courtyard, the sacrifices, the priesthood. It was all pointing to His Son, Jesus Christ. You search the Scripture because you think in them you have eternal life, but it is these that are giving testimony about Me. It's about Me. And, and, and you know, so John wrote, he says, No one has seen God at any time, except for the only begotten who's in the bosom of the Father. He has come to explain Him. The Hebrew writer says that everything in the Old Testament, he said that God had given prophecy in many portions and in many different ways. Everything is giving testimony of God and His Son and in what He would do for mankind was born of the descendant of David according to the flesh. A descendant of David. That's a theme also that we find in the Old Testament because the Savior of the world, the ruler of the world, would be a descendant of King David. And Jesus Christ, the genealogy, can be traced all the way back to King David. But there's a promise there that God would rule and reign over His people the nation of Israel, and sitting on the throne of King David for 1,000 years. A lot of people says that God is done with the Jew. But here in the book of Romans, chapters 9, 10, 11, Paul goes on to explain, he's not done with the Jew. He's going to keep every single promise he made to the Jew. He's not done with them. And that it should be glorious news for you and me because God keeps his promise. If he doesn't keep his promise to the Jew to rule and reign with them for 1,000 years, then we have no hope. We have no hope. But Paul says he's going to keep that promise. His focus is upon the church today, but his focus is going to go back to the Jew. He's going to fulfill all of his promises to the Jew. And we've just seen that as we went through the book of Revelation, that, that, that God dealing with the Jewish nation. He says, uh, according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Declared. That could also be translated confirmed or proven the Son of God. Jesus Christ, His resurrection, proves that He was God in the flesh. That's the evidence. That's the proof. If Jesus didn't rise from the grave, we have no evidence that God has forgiven sin. And Jesus even told the Pharisees, He says, you destroyed this temple, and in three days, I 
will raise it up. Now, we know that there was the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. We know that the Father raised the Son from the dead. But he said, I will raise my body from the dead. I will raise it. How could he say that? Because he was God in the flesh. The Son of God in the flesh manifested. Great is the mystery of godliness. That God was manifested, revealed, uh, fleshed out. He was, he was manifested in the flesh. With the power of the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience, uh-oh, uh-oh, the obedience of faith among all Gentiles. There's the key. It's impossible for, for us, for me, to be, be obedient without faith. Without faith, you cannot please God. But it's faith that brings about obedience. It's faith. If I truly believe in what God's Word has said, my works are going to follow my actions. If I... It truly am in a relationship with the Lord based upon my belief that He is the Son of God, based upon my belief that He was resurrected from the dead, based upon my belief that there's something greater than this wretched fallen world, there's a hope, the hope of heaven, then I'm going to be operating in obedience. I'm going to be in tune with how His Holy Spirit's Speaking to me. I'm going to be responding in the way His Word and the Spirit tells me to respond. You know, because my reaction oftentimes is somebody kicks me in the shin, well, I'm going to kick them somewhere it hurts even more. That's my response. But the Lord says don't respond with your fleshly impulses. Respond to how my voice is speaking to, to you because my sheep hear my voices. My, my voice is my voice. My sheep hear my voice. But it's, it's, you cannot, no one can be operating in obedience until they've truly put their faith in what Christ has done. Because faith in Him is going to open my ears, open my heart. Otherwise, if I, if I don't believe my sin has been dealt with, then I'm going to be focused on myself. I'm going to be focused on my, my, my image and then, because I'm so focused on myself, I'm not going to be showing love to a brother or sister. I'm going to be looking down my nose, especially if I'm really successful at what I'm doing and putting on this image, you know, squeezing myself into this Christian mode. Then I'm going to be looking down my nose at someone who's not quite gotten there yet. Say, well, you know, you need to just be more like me. You need to be, you know, more, uh, uh, what word am I looking for here? Pious, Yes. Um, but it's, it's a matter of faith. Faith is what brings about obedience. And so he's talking about, you know, the obedience among the Gentiles. Because if the, you know, because we're seeing the Gentiles, right? They're, they're, they're raping, they're murdering, they're getting drunk all the time. They stay drunk. They're hooked on these drugs. They're, they're aborting their children. They're sacrificing their children. He says, he says, if you... We, the way to bring about obedience or change in this wretched, wretched fallen world is for the Gentiles to believe in the gospel. We're not going to change this world through laws. We're not going to change this world by protesting. Paul didn't protest. He didn't go out, he didn't go out on this, this rampage or this, this, this uh, crusade to change the world and the laws of the world, to get rid of abortion, to get rid of this, or to get rid of that, or to change the heart of the nation. He, he didn't do that. He went out to proclaim the gospel message because the gospel message is what's really going to change a person. And that's what he would later say in the book of Galatians. He says, you know, if you've got love, there's going to be all kinds of manifestations of that love, and guess what? There's no law against love. We don't need established laws. Now, we do need to, to make our position known the way we vote. You know, and if, and if 
If someone brings about abortion, we need to speak truth. If someone says they're a homosexual and says, well, God loves you either way. No, we need to speak truth. But it's the truth that will set people free. It's the gospel that changes our society. He says, to all who are beloved of God in Rome. Okay, all right. so Paul, and I've got just enough time to finish this up. Paul had long wanted to go to Rome. He, I mean, he was called to the Gentiles, and he tried to get to Rome many different times. He just wasn't able to get to Rome. Um, so what is so unique about the book of Romans is because Paul did not start this church in Rome. He'd never been to Rome. He didn't know of any people in Rome. I mean, although he was a Roman, Paul was, that's another thing about Paul, he was actually a Roman citizen. He was born a Roman citizen. So he's, a, again, he was in a very unique position to proclaim the gospel to the Roman people because he knew the Roman culture as well as the Jewish culture. So that, that was one of the reasons I, uh, God you know, had, had, had prepared Paul, Paul from birth to prepare him for this mission, mission to go out in the world and proclaim the gospel. But my point is, every church, as we get into the book or the New Testament, you got the, the Ephesians, the, the, Paul had started that church in Ephesus. He went to Philippi, started a church there. He went to Colossae, he started a church there. And so what we get in the, in the New Testament from these writings is not what Paul was proclaiming when he went to Colossae, Philippi, but rather he was, he was writing to them to encourage them or to correct them, just like the Corinthians. He wrote to them to correct them. And to set up church doctrines, to set up church governments. That's, you know, this, that's where we set up our church government today. We look at what Paul had wrote. So what's so unique about the book of Romans is Paul did not start a church in Rome. He wasn't writing to correct the people of Rome. What we find unique about the book of Romans, we get an insight or a perspective of what Paul might have been preaching when he went to these cities. He's preaching the gospel message. And, it's a, and that was what was transforming people. And this is how all the churches began. So we could now imagine what Paul might have been saying when he went into Colossae or when he went into Philippi. With the book of Romans is unique in that way. He's not declaring church doctrine. Now he's declaring Old Testament doctrines based upon what God was going to do for mankind. The book of Romans is strictly about God. It's not about church government. It's not about correction. It's about God and what God has done for mankind. Again, it's a glorious book, and I'm so anxious to get into it. So he says, uh, Obedience among all the Gentiles for his namesake, among whom you are also called of Jesus Christ. Where did I miss? I missed something here, didn't I? Yeah, I did miss that verse early. Called of Jesus Christ. You're called. You realize that? The Apostle Paul was called to go out into this dark world and proclaim the gospel message. But now he's saying to the Romans, you're called. Here, listen to what Jesus wrote in John chapter 15, verse 16. Hear this, though. He says, you did not choose me but I chose you and appointed and appointed. God has appointed you. You know what that word, what that, that word appointed could also be translated to? Ordained. He said, I'm ordained by Calvary Chapel uh, Costa Mesa. That's where my ordination comes from in Calvary Chapel Cheyenne. They're the ones that sent me out to plant this church. But I'm ordained by Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa, but more importantly, I'm ordained by God. That's the greatest ordination that you can receive. And that's what Jesus is saying. Each and every one of you was ordained by Him. He's ordained you. You, you didn't choose Him. He chose you, and He's ordained you. For, the, for what? The ministry. So that you would go and bear fruit. 
So you have a specific mission. You have a specific task. So to go out and bear fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And the manifestation of that fruit is joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, uh, gentleness, self-control. This is what you've been ordained to do to bring love to this lost, forsaken, this hateful, this world of death, disease, and decay. You've been, you've been called to bear much fruit. He says, and that your fruit would remain. To bear fruit so that it will remain. See, each and every one of us, you know, I, I've been ordained. I've been given a task. I've been, I'm an apostle. Jesus sent me to Kennet to plant a church. But we're all apostles because we're all ordained and sent out. Now, some of us uh, drive a, an ambulance. That's the ordination. That's where they've been sent. Why is, you know, why is, so, what, what, why are we sent to a specific job? To bear fruit. As a truck driver, you're, you're called to bear fruit. You said we're all sent out into the world to bear fruit, to proclaim the gospel message. It's a dark world. We're to be that, that tiny little match in a dark room. We're to bring light into the darkness. We're oftentimes trying to shy away from the darkness, but we're called to go into the darkness, you see. We're to, we're called to go into this world to, to shine the marvelous light of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm the light of the world. But then later on, he says, you are the light of the world. You're the ones that's called into a dark ro world. You see, in the tabernacle, again, everything's given testimony of Jesus. In the tabernacle, in the temple, there was one light source. It was the golden lampstand. It lit up the room, that room representing the world. That, that was to be the light of the world. Now, this soon, this light is going to be taken out of the world. And we're going to see darkness come flooding in. And this is where the Antichrist is going to come to power. But, he's, but right now, we have a ministry. We have a calling to proclaim the gospel message into this dark world. To all who are beloved of God in Rome. Now, that's another thing. How did this church begin into Rome? And uh, we'll wrap up with this. Going to Acts chapter 2, verse 10. So again, Paul did not start the church in Rome, but we see a church in Rome. Actually, it wasn't really a church in Rome. It was actually a bunch of home ministries. Uh, there was People would have a Bible study in their home. And I think that's something that maybe we might be getting back to here soon. Uh, this is where the fellowship, the tightness, the growth would take place. It'd start off with a, just a small fellowship in someone's home. A couple of families would come together. They'd read their Bibles. They'd study together. And from that home fellowship, there was many churches that began to grow. When we were at Calvary Chapel Cheyenne, it was because we were a church, you know, the, by the Today it's like a thousand people. We started off with like fifty people, twenty-five to fifty people, and then as soon it grew into a thousand. But because that church was growing so fast, there's many different home fellowships that sprung up because no one really knew each other. We had like two or three services on a Sunday morning. I went up to the guy, and I was an elder of the church at this time, maybe even a pastor at that point. But I go up to this guy and I said, "Hey, man, it's good to see you. How long have you been attending?" Thinking it was like a week or two. Is it five years? <laughs> but it's the home fellowships, you know, that kept the ministry so tight. And this, is the, this was the Roman church. But how did it get? How did it get started? If Paul didn't go to Rome, if Peter didn't go to Rome, or James go to Rome, how did this get started? And it began, I believe, right here in Acts chapter 2. We'll, we'll just read through those verses real quick. It says, When the day of Pentecost had come, Jesus uh, had been, you know, ascended into heaven. He told the people to go, his people, the disciples, to go and wait for the coming of his Holy Spirit, uh, for the comfort to come. They're up in the room, and they're praying together. They're, they're, they're uh, ministering and, and fellowshipping together. This is, and so this is the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all gathered in one place. And suddenly, there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues of fire distributing themselves and resting on each one of them. 
So they're in the room together to huddle together, and then suddenly this big old rush of wind come in, and then they, there was an appearance, something like fire. And as best they could describe it, it was like a light that was descending on this fiery light that descended upon them. And the, suddenly they, they all started uh, speaking with tongues. He says, verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. So all these people, they're, 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 they're speaking in tongues. No one's know what they're saying at this point, but they're all speaking in tongues. They're all speaking a foreign language. That's basically what happened. Suddenly, Ron, you know, he, he doesn't know Spanish, but suddenly, out of nowhere, he begins to speak in Spanish. Now imagine, you know, there's other people, all of us, right here in this room. We all begin to speak a different language. You know, Bruce starts to speak, uh, speak, uh, <laughs> speak French. Courtney begins to speak German. But it's all blended together, and it's all being understood, right? That, that's what we're about to learn. It's all being understood. Now, there were Jews in, living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. So, these Jews were staying in Jerusalem at this point, but they're coming from different nations. They're coming from different places. They're there for this Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Booths. So, this, uh, so it says, and, and when the sound occurred, there came a, they, there, the crowd came together, and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. So suddenly there's a big rush of wind, this mighty sound, fire descending upon the heads of these people, and these people start speaking in tongues, and apparently it was so loud that the neighborhood begins to hear it. It says, man, what in the world is happening? So they begin to gather around this house in which the, the, the tongues of fire... Are, are being spoken here. It says, and he says, and, and how it was, and they were amazed and astonished, saying, Why are not all these people speaking Galilee? Why are not all these people speaking Galileans? Galileans were a bunch of hicks, right? Just imagine, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, just yeah, they're just like us. So, but these were very uneducated people. These were very unimpressive people. These were the low, lowly workers of the area. But these are the ones that's now speaking all these foreign languages. He says in verse eight, and how is it that we each hear them in our own language which we were born? So <clears throat> imagine people speaking a bunch of gibber jabbers, right? But I'm hearing all this. But I'm hearing it in my own language. All these people are speaking wildly, crazily. But the hearer is hearing that from his own language. And he goes on to describe this. In verse 9, he says, per, per, par, Parthians, Medes, Emilites, the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, uh, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, in the districts of Libya, Cree, uh, and visitors of Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we, we hear in our own language the speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued. Verse 10. Rome. So this is how I believe the church of Rome actually got started. They had this big feast of Pentecost. They hear the, the gospel message as the 120 are now speaking in very different languages. They hear the gospel message. Now they're taking it back to Rome, to their home place. They're in Jerusalem, in this very religious place, this, 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 this place of enlightenment, this place of the Word. But they take it from there, and they go to Rome. And that's where the gospel begins. It's just like the guy who, who was uh, uh, on the island of... Uh, all right, he had a demon possession. But anyway, he, he gets saved. Jesus cast out the demons. There was legions within him. And then he, he wanted to follow after Jesus. Jesus said, no, go back to your hometown. Go back to your people. And that place today, I wish I could remember the name of it, but that, Gerardes. what's that? Gerardes. Ger Gerardes, yeah. The Gadaras. It, uh, it soon, after this, becomes one of the most dense population of Christians of all the of the places in Asia. And to this day, the, 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 the density of Christianity is the greatest there than any other place. Because of one man 
who had been saved, and went back in obedience to what the Lord Jesus Christ was telling him and spoke to his friends, his neighbors, and relatives. Um, all right, let's uh, wrap this up. And it says, uh, To all who were called, I'm sorry, all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, not called as saints, but called saints. You are a saint. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a saint. Either you're a saint or you ain't. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, if you're not following Jesus Christ, then you ain't a saint. But if you, if you uh, are a believer, and then and this, this, you is a saint. <laughs> you is or you ain't. <laughs> uh, and we'll, we'll uh, get into this grace and peace thing next week. <laughs> As we continue on, picking verse 8. I did get to finish. I'm a little running late, but we did get to finish. So what we have is the book of Romans written to Christians that are in Rome, a church that was not started by Paul, but this is a church that he desired to reach. And he would eventually get there, by the way, in all expense paid by the Roman government. He'll, the Roman government will actually get him to Rome. He's tried so hard to get there. Uh, Paul will eventually end up as a prisoner uh, held captive by the, uh, in Caesarea for two years. Then he'd be re-released, and then, then he'd be recaptured. Uh, after some stuff that happened in Jerusalem, he ended up going to Rome. Uh, but what we have in the book of Romans is the, the gospel. It's about what God has done for mankind. It's the good news. And uh, it's going to be an exciting book to get into. Now, as we get deeper into this, we're going to get some bad news before we get to that good news. And the bad news is who we are and where, where we're headed and why we're in the condition that we're in. But the good news is Jesus is taking care of it. And we're going to heaven. Amen?